Tired of dealing with vein disease? Have your symptoms gotten worse? Oh, these spider veins are ugly. My legs and ankles are always swollen. My legs are tired of standing all day. While some symptoms can be managed by lifestyle changes, other factors are out of your control. Get help from the experts at Vein Clinics of Hawaii. To learn more about your treatment options, call 427-5565 or visit veinclinicsofhawaii.com. Aloha, Hawaii. It's time for the Vein Clinics of Hawaii radio show. Their team's approach to diagnosing problems and developing solutions and treatment plans are beyond compare. So let's get started with your host of the show, Mike Buck, and medical director, Dr. Randall Juliff of the Vein Clinics of Hawaii. Yep, 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 and it's the veinclinicsofhawaii.com. Don't forget that little .com. We're going to refer you to the website often because that's where the action is. Uh, Vein Clinics of Hawaii on four islands, as you know by now, started out on the big island and osmosed and got to the big city not too long ago. Dr. Randall Juliff is the medical director there. We've been talking about an awful lot of things, and one of the things that, that, that I found out, and by the way, not only do I host a show for Doc, but I'm also a patient, and one of the things I found out that every single one of us is somewhere on the chart of, uh, of uh, venous uh, insufficiency of some kind. Maybe a little tiny thing like a spider vein, might be a big old horrible blood clot that you gotta have surgically removed, but it, it is calming to know where you're in there. And today, Doc, you, you give me another chart, and I love charts and lists because I've always wanted to know, because I guess I'm a competitive person, where am I in the big picture on this chart? Where <laughs> yeah. is Mike Buck in this deal? And isn't mm. that one of the biggest things in your profession is to find out where a patient is with regards to how much of this disease do they have and how much suffering are they going through? Yeah, uh, yeah where, they, where they are on the scale mm -hmm. of severity. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, what what is the what is the reason? You know, there's there's a variety yeah. of different reasons why uh, people might have uh, vein disease, yeah. venous insufficiency, varicose veins, all that stuff. Uh, so when people come in, we uh, we we have uh, you know we have to define all of those things because uh, it, it's going to impact um, you know how we approach them. You know, what are we going mm -hmm. to do? Um, how urgently are we going to do it? Uh, you know, when when do we intervene? When do we not intervene? Uh, so, yeah, those are all, you know, very important questions as we're uh, approaching each individual patient. Okay, we have, gang, over the, over the years that we do the show, uh, tried to find out where you are on the chart. And there, there's actually, in this particular field that I learned, uh, there, the, there's this range of six different places and one's as different as day and night. And a little tiny one would be a spider leg on my knee, and a big one would be a huge big hole in my leg that doesn't heal. Somewhere in the middle is where we are, right? And so, <laughs> yeah. so I was uh, elated to find out where I was, only because it, it sort of explains things. And number one, when you're considering your options for treatment, you also find out from the doc, in your case, how severe it is, you know, mm -hmm. where this is and, and how do we map out a treatment program that is going to make you not suffer or make you healthier, period. Right, right. And yeah. there you are, simple. Yeah. Not really, but that, we're saying it sounds simple. Well, well, yeah. I think, you know, we, we use a lot of uh, of these kind of, uh, you know, classification mm -hmm. systems in, in all types of medicine. Sure. Uh, and uh, the, in, the, in the world of veins, we have something called the SEEP classification C E A P C E A P right, yeah, yeah. yeah and the one that we the the part of that that we use most often uh is the C part of it and that you just alluded to that it, it's uh, you know C1 through 6 C1 being you know just spider veins mm -hmm. uh and nothing nothing other than that um and at the other end of the spectrum yeah. with a lot of space in between but at the other end of the spectrum is uh, somebody with a uh, yeah non-healing ulcer of the lower extremity, you know, something that we call a venous stasis ulcer. So, you know, most people are somewhere in between. But the other, um, so we, we want to, a, a person comes in, a patient comes in, we want to know where they are on that clinical spectrum because, uh, you know, that's going to uh, certainly impact how we, we're going to approach that patient. Uh, but we also need to know those other aspects of the classification system that we use, the E, A, and P part of it. So 
E has to do with etiology, and, and uh, so that means, you know, why? Mm-hmm. Why do they have a problem? Uh, you know, what is it about them that made them, de- you know, develop the yeah. venous uh, disease that they have at this moment uh, and uh, have the clinical problem? So we're going to touch on that in a second because we're going we're to talk about a patient here today mm-hmm. that uh, has an unusual uh, cause for their venous insufficiency. Okay. One, one thing that I've learned, gang, is a lot of this is inherited. Yeah. And from what I understand, looking through the notes that I did, this guy was almost predetermined to be doomed into having some of this stuff. Well, he was 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to be <laughs> yeah. nice. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Grandma. I mean, I appreciate it a lot, Mom. In my in my case, it was my mom. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there there's there's inherited, mm-hmm. um, and, and then there's congenital. Sure. We're, we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. Okay. Um, but, uh, but he had a congenital reason, and that's why I say. So it was in his genes that he mm-hmm. was going to develop this mm-hmm. process, uh, and... Uh, uh, yeah, it's sort of an absolute thing. The only question is how bad is it, is it going to be for a patient like this? But getting back to the other two uh, parts of that classification system, the A and the P, A is anatomy. So that means um, which of the veins in our mm-hmm. leg are having the problem. Is there disease? Is there non-function? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we've, we've talked about before there are the deep veins and the mm-hmm. superficial veins, and then each of those, you know, systems have uh, different different branches and part of the classific- classification system is to you know spell out which yeah. veins are affected so that's- uh, which by the way I found out and the the way they're divided my friends is really interesting because some of them are so you can hardly even see them and some of them are like big fought by like big pipes yeah and they're all veins right yeah sure yeah, yeah all sizes yeah. Um, and then the P part of that is uh, what's called the uh, pathophysiology now that just means <clears throat> the you know, the physiologic abnormality that's happening. Uh, and basically, it's one of two things. Either there's reflux, which we talk about yeah, a lot, yeah. you know, venous reflux. Uh, and uh, that has to do with uh, valve failure. You know, we've talked about that extensively and blood going in the wrong direction. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other part, the other possibility is what we call obstructive. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and there can be obstructive processes within the venous system that can lead to disease. For instance, DVT. You know, if somebody, okay. If yeah, so, okay. No, some, I get it. If somebody it. develops a blood clot in their vein, then that's going to cause obstruction to flow. Uh, and even if they didn't have a valve problem before, that obstruction of flow up through the vein is going to very likely in the long term, you know, create some vein functional problems. Interestingly enough, gang, if you've, if you've been around the show before, you've heard this, uh, it, it bears a little bit of repeating, and that is because the CEAP uh, is, is, and this chart, this, this clinical chart of one to six, uh, it, it, it's different from ev- for everybody, but, but people need to know that this isn't a disease like when you cut yourself with an ax when you're chopping wood. Now you have a big problem that needs to be fixed right away. <laughs> yep. This comes up and sneaks up on you. Sure. And all of the things that you've told me and that our listeners have learned uh, over the years that we've been doing the show is that, you know, Everybody travels at a different speed, but this is the progression. And to get from one place to the other, you're not going to cure it, but you can sure slow it down. Mm. And isn't that sort of interesting? Because there's no no guarantee that whatever treatment you get ever going to make the condition go away because it's not likely to go away. Uh, it's not likely to go away because of the genetic component. There you that, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Which so, is guy we're going to talk about. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, him as well as a lot of other people. Uh, but we, if we manage it appropriately, it should not be a, you know, a, a, a health problem for that person, you know, going through their life. Uh, and that, but that goes back to the, uh, the, you know, that's the reason why we have to do adequate follow-up. You know, you, after we even treat people, we still need to follow that patient over time. And often we encourage people to come back about every year for an ultrasound just to make sure that things are stable, mm-hmm. make sure there's nothing new coming up. Because if they have that, if they have that genetic influence that they have a propensity to develop vein issues, then they, they might. Uh, but hopefully if we do adequate surveillance, it'll be kept to a minimum and we can catch things early and uh, intervene uh, in a minimal sort of fashion mm-hmm. as opposed to do 
doing, you know, some, uh, you know, the bigger procedures that we often have to do. It, it, it seems to me that, you know, of all the medical conditions you can talk about, things like asthma, high blood pressure, cancer, blood stroke, all of these different things, a lot of it is it's genetic. But yeah. it, it seems like in, in our case or in the vein case, it's prevalent. I mean, that is the main reason. Genetics. Yeah. Well, I, I have found that, uh, yeah, for the most part, uh, the uh, you know, the inheritance factor is very, very strong. Yeah. Now, there are obviously uh, lifestyle th- things that also impact it, for mm-hmm. sure. You know, pregnancies and people who work on their feet, all those things. Um, so anyway, getting back to then the fourth category, the, this, the E part of that, uh, we sort of skipped over that initially, but that's, uh, the E part of it stands for etiology. And the, uh, so the, the, that's getting to the why, you know, why does this patient have venous disease? And within the, within the classification uh, part of etiology, it can either be primary, secondary, or congenital. So primary uh, venous insufficiency uh, it has to do with, you know, that's sort of the run-of-the-mill run, run of the mill sort of uh, version mm-hmm. of venous insufficiency. Again, it's inherited. Uh, it's uh, venous insufficiency in and of itself. It's not, it's not due to any other disease mm-hmm. process. Uh, and uh, most of these people just have, uh, again, inherited the propensity to have that valve failure you know, valves, it, valves in the veins are failing. The blood is going in the wrong direction, creating what we call re- reflux. And that then leads to not only symptoms, but problems with their legs mm-hmm. as it, uh, you know, goes on. Uh, so uh, so that's an inherited uh, type uh, of the disease process, but not really the gen- you know, specifically specific genetic problems, which we're going to talk about in a second. The other, um, the other category, subcategory within etiology is secondary. Mm-hmm. So secondary means that their venous insufficiency is due to some other process, like we mm-hmm. mentioned before. Uh, DVT, you know, blood clot formation in a vein is ultimately going to have uh, some impact on the function of that vein. And that would be a, so a secondary form of uh, venous insufficiency. Maybe that patient had trauma or mm-hmm. maybe they had some sort of surgical intervention or, uh, you know, other, yeah. you know, health related intervention. Which is compounding the felony, right? Yeah. I mean, you got one thing going on here and now something else. And all of a sudden, now the two come together, it's almost urgent that you do something about it. Sure. Yeah. 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 Then the uh, the third part, the third uh, option within the etiology category is congenital and that's what we're we're going to talk about a patient today with a congenital reason for their venous insufficiency. Um, it's the least common. You know, we see hmm. mo- most of the patients that we see uh, have a uh, primary etiology. You know, they have uh, primary valve failure and uh, re- related venous insufficiency. A smaller number have secondary. They've had, you know, blood clots or whatever, mm-hmm. and that's the uh, cause for their, or the reason that they have then gone on to develop uh, vein problems. Uh, the congenital part is, uh, you know, probably just a few, a couple percentage points of, mm-hmm. of the people, maybe not even that much. Small percent. Yeah, it's yeah, a very yeah. small percent. Uh, and these people are people that are born with a genetic defect that is the cause or the reason for them developing ultimately their venous insufficiency. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a good number of different forms of this, and they're all fairly specific. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to talk about one of them today. Uh, but, uh, again, it's, it's not very common, we, but we always have to be thinking about this kind of stuff when we're evaluating people, even if we think it's just, you know, run-of-the-mill mm-hmm. primary venous insufficiency. We always have to keep in the back of our, our minds, gee, is there some other, other process going on here that we mm-hmm. have to be aware of? Yeah, and on top of that, gang, I want to remind you that, uh, you know, there's, there's any number of ways where you can get in touch with Dr. Juliff and his staff, but the easiest way is to check out the website. And, we, and this program is really sort of designed to make you aware of things that are going on and then pointing you at the website so that you can go take a look at it. Because the quicker you find out, when we go back to the CEAP the doc's talking about, the clinical part, the one to six, is my goal is to make sure that everybody that listens finds out if they are on the chart, where are they? And, and what treatment is indicated to make you a, be able to live with this condition and always keep, uh, you know, stay, uh, 
excuse the expression, and step ahead of it. So you put your <laughs> best leg forward, you know. And so that that's yeah. kind of that's kind of uh, uh, neat to me in that it seems like what you do is pretty organized. I mean, once you build yeah. a case file on me, then it's pretty, in, it not only to indicate what's a treatment program, but what's the likelihood of me, me, me not getting any worse. Let's get a handle on yeah. this thing. Uh, well, it, it is uh, it is indicative of prognosis. I think I think that's, uh, you know, your last comment was getting at that. Um, you know, how, how, how well are we going to be able to treat it, mm -hmm. uh, and and what's the likelihood of a, any particular patient having further problems in the future? Sure. How how diligent do they have to be in uh, in keeping track of it, of maintaining surveillance, of continuing to do you know those conservative types of things that it will benefit them over a long period of time, like wearing stockings that we talk about all the time. Uh, so yeah, the the classification system is is such a beautiful thing because it lays all of that out for us. So yeah, anyway, it's like it's like the when they explain on the Richter scale, yeah. uh, or or what sort of a, a tsunami is it, and and and, yeah. and and you want to prevent that. The thing that I think is neat, and it's it, it's that if anything, Doc, I think you and 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 the other specialists like yourself are brutally honest because of experience. It is almost, you're not going to get surprised by too much of this. I mean, you know, I know that there's new things happening all the time, but basically, uh, once you identify where I am, it's, you're going to help me determine where I'm going. That's all, that's yeah. all I want. It's all you can expect, really. Right, right. And we, and we try to be honest with people, too, uh, you know, uh, because, uh, again, it impacts, for them, it impacts how conscientious and how diligent they have to be in uh, staving off further problems in the future, especially those people in those higher C classifications, you know. Yeah, and that's why I love it, gang, when we zero in and specifically bring up a particular case, because I do know that for every every one of us that are out there, uh, there may be two out of the hundred or three out of the hundred that are going to say, "That's me." Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know, that sure. happens a lot, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So the patient that uh, I wanted to talk about today is a forty-eight-year-old guy. Um, and uh, very active, otherwise very healthy. Um, and he was actually, uh, he came into our Maui uh, office uh, uh, a few months ago, um, and uh, his presenting complaints were achiness, muscle cramping, burning in his feet and toes, restless leg, difficulty healing wounds, and marked swelling. So, you know, he well, that's a lot of stuff on that plate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, but you know, a, a lot of symptoms, mm -hmm. but all of them very typical of you know just general yeah. venous insufficiency. I mean, we we see those types of complaints all the time. Uh, he because of the fact that he ha stated that he had had you know some injuries to his leg that created little wounds here mm -hmm. and there over you know the last several years that he found difficult to heal. Mm -hmm. uh, that immediately kind of, you know, throws up some red flags. You know, we're dealing with probably a little more advanced uh, set of circumstances here that need, uh, you know, immediate attention. Uh, but in addition to those symptoms, uh, he also had very extensive varicose veins throughout his entire right leg um, and, uh, and a, fair, um, a, a pretty substantial amount of swelling throughout his right leg. Um, the, um, I think the uh the, the the hallmark uh kind of finding in this patient was that all of these symptoms were pretty advanced uh all of the findings mm -hmm. you know the way that his uh his leg looked on examination also were very very yeah. uh, advanced but it was happening only to his right leg um his left leg looked perfectly normal isn't that i mean yeah it's not like me i got both legs i mean right well neither neither are really normal yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah uh and, and most people are like that yeah, yeah. most people with again garden variety venous insufficiency uh usually they're going to have it in both legs and uh it's surprisingly symmetrical although it's not uncommon for one leg mm. to be a little worse than the other typically yeah. it's because one leg is a little further along in the timeline of the whole process uh, but 
it is unusual for one leg to be so bad mm. and the other leg to be to be essentially completely normal. And, and, and I'm so excited to find out the more about this guy. And I know that those of you listening are too. But I, the only question I have at this point, because looking at what his symptoms are and what he had to what he was putting up with, and at 48, had he sought treatment before? No, he had that's not. A, that's what I'm amazed at. Yeah, look at how much this guy suffered for so long in little bits and starts that had he had the ability to find out 10 years before his his ability to enjoy but anyway the, the point is better late than never yeah. so so well, better at, late at, than never. at 48 this guy looks he comes in and you say here's a here's a guy we got a lot a lot that we can help him with yeah, yeah. and and especially in in this this patient in particular you know had it been addressed you know 20 years prior mm-hmm. which it could have been yeah of course. Well, it's kind of a double-edged sword there because, um, you know, I think that we, th- this type of problem, we can deal with so much better now mm-hmm. with, with the minimally with the, and your equipment invasive and everything. way. Sure. Yeah. yeah, but, uh, you know, had he been treated 10, 15 years ago when, you know, minimally invasive procedures were coming onto the scene, uh, yeah, it, he probably would have benefited from that. But bottom line is better late than better never. Better late than never. Sure. By the way, gang, I, I'm so glad that this particular case history is a, 48 year old male because a lot of times until you learn on this program venous insufficiency is an equal opportunity disease most people think it's all women yeah. and, and and the cosmetic part of it maybe uh women because they tend to do it a little bit more than men but this is certainly a good example of no 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 and and even age it's not 65 plus this guy's only 48 right right yeah, yeah and, and as we'll find out here in a bit it he started with his at a very early age sure. so anyway so uh what do we have to consider when we're looking at somebody with what we call unilateral swelling uh and uh you know that uh, of course means that uh you know he's got symptoms and swelling uh on just one leg and not the other so you know the first thing we have to c- consider is is there a deep vein process that might be going on that isn't immediately apparent to us you know when mm-hmm. we when we look at uh you know a legs you know superficially uh, we can't tell what's going on in the deep venous system. Even when we do our initial ultrasound, we don't yeah. see, uh, you know, of the it's deep It's amazing how deep it higher. is, right? That's why they call it deep. Yeah. They're way in there, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So, and, and there, are also, there are also large, deep veins in the pelvis and in the abdomen mm. that we can't visualize with the ultrasound. Mm. So we have to often do other things to make sure that there isn't anything going on there. Uh, some of the other things that we have to consider is, is was there a history of trauma or surgery? You know, mm-hmm. did, did he get into a bad, you know, motorcycle mm-hmm. accident you know, 15 years ago? Or you know, did he have surgery for that? Is there a history of cancer uh, and possibly surgical intervention for uh, something along those lines? Uh, did the patient have, uh, you know, radiation therapy? Mm-hmm. You know, radiation therapy can have uh, an adverse effect on all types of blood vessels. Oh. Uh, and uh, so, you know, did is there a history of that? Um, is there external compression on a, um, on a vein, again, that might be higher in the body that we can't uh, see and we don't necessarily, you know, visualize with ultrasound? So, there's, you know, a number of different things that we have to consider when we're looking at um, somebody with swelling and symptoms in only one leg. Then there are other, you know, vascular type abnormalities. There's something called May Thurner syndrome. We've talked about that before. Wait a minute. I got to add that to my list. You, you, <laughs> yeah. you said we talked about it before. My memory's not clicking in on that one. What's yeah. that? Well, May Thurner is uh, a situation where a uh, an artery... Higher up in the body, in the mm-hmm. pelvis. An artery, not a vein. An well, an artery yeah. is uh, compressing the vein. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, can cause a fair amount of obstruction to that vein. Uh, and that's one of those obstructive reasons yeah. okay. for somebody to have, uh, you know, vein disease. Uh, so we have to, you know, that's one of the things that we think about uh, when, we, uh, when we're looking at somebody with swelling in one leg. Now, May Thurner itself tends to affect the left leg more so than the right. This guy's le- right leg was swollen, so we're, we're, we're probably not really concerned about uh, May Thurner. But uh, so anyway, we th- those are all the things we have to consider. 
Uh, and usually there are other clues that, you know, kind of help us hone in on what's going on uh, with any one particular patient. Uh, in this guy, some of the other clues that we were presented with were the very, very early onset of his varicose veins. Um, he started to have varicose veins in high school, you know, so yeah. mid-teenager years, uh, which is unusual, but is it unheard of to have uh, sort of, you know, pr just primary run-of-the-mill venous insufficiency in a young guy that age? Um, no, it's not unheard of. No. You know, we have a handful of patients, uh, you know, young men. 15, 16, 17, that have had pretty substantial varicose veins mm -hmm. that we have treated. Uh, again, it's unusual, but it's not unheard of. So. Hey, by the way, I had had one of these things a long time ago, <clears throat> uh, and it was right around you know high school or college time. It was about as big around as a half a dollar. Remember those things? You used to have things called half a dollars? What ever happened to the 50 cent piece? Don't see them around oh, anymore. No. And it's all quarters. <laughs> anyway, this is about as big as a half a dollar. It's gone now. Can't ever tell it was it was there, but it was there for many, many years. And I learned from Dr. Juliff that the reason why that was there, was that was one of the things that I inherited. And it, it really never manifested in any pain or any discomfort, but it certainly was something that I could see. Uh, and and it, it showed us, didn't it, that there were things going on underneath there mm -hmm. that needed treatment. And it was just sort of your body saying, hey, look at this. You got to go have this looked at because this is not, this is, quote, not normal. Yeah, yeah right. You know? It's a little, a little so, sign. So this guy put up with a lot of stuff. Uh, did, yeah. Did, did he understand or did he explain or did he think that some of it might have been from mom or dad or whatever? Did, did my whole family has leg issues or pain issues like this? Well, in him, it was a little different because he did not have a, s a substantial family history of venous insufficiency. Wow, wow. So, um, and, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because that was another, you know, kind of clue yeah, yeah. to what was going on here. He he didn't, so, so he probably didn't have... Uh, again, run-of-the-mill primary venous insufficiency. And, and getting back to the young teenage boys that we have treated in the past that have had varicose veins, uh, which, you know, typically that's unusual. But those, those patients, uh, those young men, uh, typically had problems in both legs. Mm -hmm. And t typically in a young, young person, you know, either male or female, if they develop varicose veins at a very young age, like high school age, uh, yeah. typically those people have a very, very strong hi family history uh, of uh, venous insufficiency. Probably both sides of their family, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, both mother and father have that genetic component. Uh, and again, this guy did not have any of that. So uh, another thing was that uh, at a pretty young age, again, probably high school age, he began noticing that his right leg was bigger than yeah. the left leg. So uh, not only was it bigger, you know, in girth, uh, you know, and it, but it was also a little longer. Now, it wasn't long, uh, you know, to the extent These, these that, are things, by the way, that you keep track of and you measure, because that's what we've been doing on my legs. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and am I right to assume that sometimes the patients have no idea that one's bigger than the other? That's just, that's just my legs. Uh, you, you know, a lot of times they just, yeah, yeah. kind of grow used to it and yeah. don't really, uh, you know, put a lot of importance Until on it. Until somebody says, hey, that <laughs> leg's pretty big, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You know, does sure. that happen? Some, yeah. Oh, you know, I'm sure yeah. it does. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, as, as he, and as he got older, um, he noticed that that, you know, continued, that mm -hmm. pattern continued where the right leg was, was bigger. And it wasn't only just swelling, uh, it was, it was, you know, the, the leg itself, the musculature, the soft tissue, the, you know, the bony structure obviously was, uh, yeah. bigger if it was, if the leg was longer. Um, so, <clears throat> and then the other thing was that at a very young age, he noticed having a birthmark on the right leg, and then uh, you know, then I when I was talking to him, I said, "Well, you know, did your when you were young, did your mother say, yeah, you had that since birth and that kind yeah. of thing?" And and he did. So mm -hmm. this was a uh, you know a, a dark purplish kind of you know uh, thing discoloration yeah, 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 yeah. on his leg that you know typically people. Uh, referred to as a birthmark. It didn't go away. It got a little bigger with time. Uh, and uh, Are they ever dangerous? 
They can be, yes. Is that right? They yeah. get infected or something? Uh, well, not not necessarily infection, but yeah, they're they're well in in this scenario, uh, it can. Uh, well, we'll talk about what happens <laughs> in this scenario, but I'm getting but, ahead of myself here. Yeah, the uh, well, that birthmark basically mm. is a vascular, what we call a vascular malformation. Mm. Um, that birthmark, even though it looks like it's just a discolored area yeah. to the skin. It's actually an abnormality of the development of the uh, you know, blood vessel of whatever type, mm. whether it's a vein or capillary or art, artery, whatever. But, mm. uh, you know, it's an abnormal development of the vasculature of the skin in the area beneath the gotcha. skin. Uh, so it's something that we call a vascular malformation. And that was probably, those were two of the, uh, you know, big things with this patient uh, that um, sort of were you know, red flags for us. Uh, the fact that he, the, his venous insufficiency and vein problems were so uh, early start, uh, starting uh, that one leg was bigger and also this uh, birthmark or this vascular malformation. Uh, as he has, as the years have gone by, his skin has gotten you know much more affected by the whole process. The skin is ge- becoming thick and it's becoming fibrotic. Uh, and uh, and also most notably painful, uh, you know, in the area of his leg that's most affected by all these changes. Uh, it's it's pretty tender. You, even when you uh, when you touch the skin and you know palpate his leg, uh, there's a fair amount of uh, pain that comes along with that. So, you know, putting this all together, it was it just uh, it started to sound a lot like something that we call uh, uh, clip ultranaune syndrome which is a uh, again uh, one of those congenital reasons why uh, somebody might have venous insufficiency hmm. um, and so that was our you know what we call our presumptive diagnosis which means that you know that was the diagnosis that we were going on and we had to do you know further kind of diagnostic studies to uh, you know figure it out completely so um, you know we did our usual ultrasound and um, he uh, he had venous insufficiency, primarily superficial venous insufficiency, both the great sap and small sap. Um, he had a little bit of deep venous reflux, uh, but otherwise his deep venous system looked pretty normal. Uh, one of the things in these patients is that uh, you know sometimes their deep venous system can also be fairly abnormal. So we're always concerned about that. And uh, we need to, you know, define that completely. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm. And then the other thing that we usually, you know, have to do in a patient like this that does not have a real straightforward reason for uh, their, uh, you know, venous disease and venous findings is that uh, we have to rule out other forms of vascular malformations. And in him, primarily, something that we call a an arterial venous malformation, which is a malformation that involves uh, both arteries and veins. Uh, it's something that we call a high flow uh, kind of uh, vascular malformation that has its own impl- implications. Uh, but uh, typically, we have to do something to rule that out, not only in the legs, but also higher in the pelvis and in the abdomen. And typically, we do, uh, you know, typically, we'll do an MR, what's called an, an MRA, you know, an MRI of mm-hmm. the uh, vasculature uh, or a CT scan. Um, but, uh, and we did that in him, and he did not, uh, luckily, because there is a little uh, more, you know, negative uh, uh, prognosis for people with that form of the disease. Um, so it looks like he has uh, just kind of straightforward what we call clipal ultranaune syndrome. You know, let me ask you this. I think this is important because a lot of times if you break a leg, you go to the doctor, they take an x-ray, they, they see what the deal is, they set the leg and out you go, and it heals. It seems to me that in your chosen field, that there is a tremendous amount of investigative work and deduction and testing that goes on before you discover a treatment. I mean, when somebody's got a, a le- broken leg, the treatment is put this puppy in yeah, a cast. Right. But, but it, it looks to me like this is a something that I, I think that if you go to veinclinicsofhawaii.com, by the way, you'll see some of this. You really need to visit the website because that's what we want you to do after you listen to this program. But it seems to me that what you do is a whole lot of thinking and a whole lot of testing and sorting out stuff long before you do treatment. 
That's true. And I think that's probably true in general with, you know, vascular kind of problems. Uh, you know, I, I'm not thinking, Doc, that other areas aren't important, but it doesn't seem to be that they are as demanding of investigation and thinking and theory and testing as other things are. Like vein yeah, surgery. Yeah, you know? no, you're right, you're right, Mike. I uh, I think uh, you know vascular issues in general. Uh, you know the most of the diagnostic kind of, kind of things that we do pr- define the problem pretty completely before we get to the point of treatment. And uh, that was uh, you know that kind of occurred to me uh, early on in my training because uh, my initial training was in general surgery. Uh, and that's how, you know, most people who get into eventually vascular and cardiac surgery, they go through general surgery training. So, yeah, I was going to say, uh, we, yeah. uh, you know, so we, we operated on the abdomen, uh, a lot and, uh, you know, people came in with pain or, or sim- you know, whatever symptoms. Um, and we do, we did, you know, a, uh, a, an appropriate amount of testing, but we often didn't know exactly what was going on until we got to the operating room with these patients and, you know, opened their abdomen and, and looked around, you yeah, know, was, um, wow. <laughs> as, 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 and that's, that's normal. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's uh, the nature of the beast. Um, but in, uh, in vascular surgery in general, uh, you know, we have a very, very good idea about what's going on. Uh, before we get to the operating room and uh, and the same goes uh, for here I mean you know when we were when I was doing uh, heart surgery uh, you know we knew we knew exactly what was going on uh, it, with that patient's you know circulation of the heart we knew exactly what we were going to do and uh, you know 99.9 percent of the time we didn't vary from that yeah you know? I get you yeah um, so uh, huh. and, and the, which is one of the reasons that I've been drawn to vascular surgery because you know you know you know exactly what's going on yeah. and what you need to do um, so uh, but in, in the same applies to you know venous uh, disease and the treatment of, of venous diseases yeah we, we, we need to know uh, what's going on because sometimes there may be things going on that if you take one course of action, you know, it could make things worse. Sure. You, yeah. you, you don't want to do that. And, you know, that, that is uh, very, you know, that idea is uh, exemplified uh, tremendously in a patient like this, as we'll, as we'll see as we talk about it. And more. let me also just alliterate for you all that the, 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 the reason why this fascinates me, not only do I get to host a show with the doc every week, but... I'm a patient of the doctor. I can tell you, though, that, that you know, with all of the things that he's talking about, the, uh, the the reason why you must have been drawn to it and others are that are, you know, in that field, it, it becomes, you really have to be a detective. You really have to be a researcher and a lot of other things because, like you say, you don't want to do something that's going to make something worse. Right. You know, and, and, and I do know that a lot of what you're doing here is uh, – uh, so much more modern that anybody that's listening that when when grandma had her legs stripped, you know, in in the 1960s or 70s, it was like a totally different profession. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, nowhere near um, amount of the diagnostic steps that yeah. we take today, yeah. you know, were done back then. Yeah, doesn't everybody yeah. have an ultrasound machine? <laughs> back in the day, somebody, if you'd have rolled that into your office 40 years ago, somebody said, what the heck is that? Oh, Get that yeah. out of here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's some space cadet thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just looking at ultrasound, I mean, that's a relatively new yeah. diagnostic device. And, uh, you know, back in the, in the 60s and uh, early 70s, uh, you know, we didn't have that, and there were all sorts of different things that we had to do to, s- and sometimes not even um, defining exactly what the problem was, but you know, we were yeah. g- getting diagnostic tests that just kind of inferred, you know, that this was the problem. Now you, you can just, see it. You just kind of have yeah, to go yeah. with it. Yeah. So, what is Klippel-Trenaunay syndrome? So, sometimes it's referred to as angioosteohypertrophy. Oh, jeez. Um, I'm, I'm not say even that, gonna try to write say that, that down. Three times. And, and don't don't drink a beer and say that three times. It <laughs> so, won't happen. Yeah. And that basically that just um, you know refers to the fact that uh, you know there is a vascular problem, there is a uh, muscular and soft tissue problem, and it, it, hypertrophy implies that there is enlargement of that extremity. But uh, this was first described uh, around the turn of the century. 
uh, uh, right around 1900 by two, the two physicians that it's named after, uh, two French guys named, uh, you know, Klippel and Trinone. I think the French pronunciation is a little different, but, you know, I don't know how to do that. So, uh, but, uh, you know, Maurice Klippel, uh, he lived from uh, 1858 to 1942. Uh, and uh, he was a fairly well-known French physician, as well as uh, his partner, Trinaune, that uh, helped define this. But they both uh, you know, worked as physicians in Paris and apparently had uh, a, you know, a, a small number of patients that they found this same pattern of, of process going yeah. on, uh, which basically it's, you know, the, the trio of things that we see are, you know, pronounced uh, venous problems like varicose veins, mm. uh, enlargement of an extremity, and then also that birthmark, yeah. uh, you know, the, which is the vascular malformation. And we call that a port wine stain. That just has become yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, uh, the... That's what happens on a carpet when you spur, it, spur, it, spur, it, spill a little <laughs> of that port. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, because it, it's even more pronounced, you know, the, these, uh, you know, babies are born with these things and it, it probably looks even more so on a baby as like a port wine stain yeah. because it's kind of reddish purple and, pro- you know, on a baby, it's very, very, you know, demarcated. Um, but, uh, you know, the frequency of this, uh, of this problem, uh, is again, pretty uncommon, uh, you know, it's, it's several, you know, one to three, uh, people out of a hundred thousand, you know, live births are going to have, you know, some form of this uh, disease. So it's, it's uncommon, but it's not unheard of. Uh, and you know, one of the reasons that, um, you know, I wanted to talk about this is because it isn't unheard of. Uh, we had, uh, again, this patient that came into our Maui office, we had another patient, uh, with similar kind of problems, also has uh, the diagnosis of KTS. Um, and that patient was in, in our Big Island office. So, uh, and, and the, that was just over the course of the last, uh, you know, six to eight months. So I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that maybe have not been diagnosed yet. Uh, and uh, so uh, I like to talk about things that you know, people can become aware of and, you know, say, gee, yeah, that does sound like me and maybe I need to have it looked into. You know what I'm thinking of here in the background as you're, as you're explaining this? Yeah. Those two French guys sitting in their garage coming up with all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, because isn't it really, and this is why people get things named after them, that this becomes something that you use on a regular basis. Yeah. Thank goodness that they came together and said, hey, you know what? This doesn't look right. Let's think about this. And yeah. they came up with a whole new study. Uh, absolutely. And this is, you know, this happened around the, you know, the 19, well, around 1900. So, uh, you know, we didn't, we getting, getting back to, you know, diagnosis, uh, you know, in in 1900, we had none of that, you know, we didn't even. 120 years ago. Yeah. We did, we had, we didn't have, you know, angiography or ultrasound or anything. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, when they had leeches in a bottle. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Brother. Oh my! Oh yeah. So anyway, so yeah, this this arises from a congenital defect, and and when we say congenital, we mean a genetic thing that uh, is present at birth, uh, and uh, it's the the genetics are not completely defined. However, there are genetic markers uh, that uh, will indicate whether a patient has this or not. But it has to do with you know a gene injury, and you know an injury to specific genes at some point along the way. You know this, and this happens obviously before birth. So it's either a mutation, you know, there's some alteration of a gene or an injury to a gene or something called gene translocation. But there's, you know, something, an abnormality of that specific patient's genetic code that uh, arises, you know, prior to birth and results in, you know, this trio of things happening, which in in some people can be extremely severe. Were, were you able to, and once again, going back to our patient, were you able to explain this? I mean, is this something that as, as it became apparent to you what this guy's condition was, that it's something that he should probably know? I oh, mean, yeah. You know, you yeah, gotta, yeah. You know, and, 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 and I'm wondering if there's a relief factor that kicks in when somebody says, geez, I don't know what, you know, thank goodness you found this because I had no clue. Yeah, yeah. I, the, I think that was the yeah, case yeah. Uh, because, yeah, the, the first time I saw this guy, I, I had, uh, you know, the inclination that something like this was going on. 
Um, and I talked to him about it. I said, yeah, you know, you, unfortunately, you don't have a straightforward sort of thing. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, there is a little bit of relief there because he knows now what's going on. Uh, and, and we now can contend yeah, with it. Sure. You know, we yeah. can make things as good as we possibly can. Um, uh, it's a, you know, I yeah. think he was a little discouraged in yeah. that, you know, the more I talked about it, the more it became apparent that this is not a straightforward yeah. thing. And it's something that he's probably going to have to deal with the rest of his life. Uh, not probably. He yeah, yeah. is and going to have to deal with this yeah, the rest of his same, life. Same as me and gang. There's another thing I want to tell you. And this comes up every now and again. And because of time, I mean, we have a lot of more things we're trying to cover today. But I want to tell you that uh, unlike other conditions or other diseases, what what Doc is doing is not searching for the right medication of the pill for you. Because a lot of what you do is in in your area of expertise, Doc, is is surgery. I mean, you know, there are certain things. There are no, here's a vein pill. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and no. I, I, you know, I mean, maybe someday there will be. And I, I know there's probably guys in sitting in their garages trying to come up with that <laughs> stuff. But, yeah. but in actual fact, what it takes is a... a a trained physician to deal with with this condition rather than a pill, or, yeah, or a potion or a cream. Well, it's it, with most venous disease, yeah. it's a mechanical problem. Yeah, That's yeah. what it boils down to. And so uh, you need a mechanic. There you are. Yeah, you're, right. my, you're my leg mechanic. <laughs> I'm yeah. just a plumber. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, you you need a mechanical remedy, and that's typically more than just a pill. Absolutely. So, uh, anyways, uh, so this the the. The vascular malformation that we've been talking about is uh, something that we call a, a low-flow vascular malformation. And uh, low flow has to do with the fact of what it's made, what this you know vascular malformation is made up of. And, and in uh, clipal Trinone syndrome, typically it's a capillary kind of thing. So it's, a, it's an overgrowth of capillaries. You know, capillaries are those very, very, very tiny blood vessels that kind of connect the arteries with the veins. You know, arteries uh, bring blood, you know, from the heart to our body. And, uh, you know, it, when it gets to the end of the road sort of thing, uh, it, you know, releases oxygen. And after it has, after those red blood cells have released ox oxygen, they go through the capillary system, which is the uh, tiny, tiny little, you know, roadways that get the blood then back into the venous system. And so it can be transported back to the Heart. So, uh, you know, we're talking about very, very tiny little capillaries, and when they over, when they they become overgrown, and uh, you know, more dense, uh, and uh, probably a little enlarged, that's mm. then when we see that port wine stain. So, okay. you know, the 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 uh, in this situation, now there are other birthmarks that that have do have to do with, you know, pigmentation of mm. the skin. Right. But that's not this. This is a of uh, that. There's a vascular reason why. We have that, uh, you know, uh, abnormal, you know, uh, coloring of the skin. You know, what happens if somebody says, you know, I've always been meaning to get rid of that thing. You know yeah. what I mean? You know, let's get, let's yeah. take it off. It, it wouldn't seem to me that if you just took it away that it would really accomplish much. Uh, other than appearance, no, probably yeah, yes. Yeah, interesting. Probably yeah. yes, and and there have been, um, you know, people have done that mm -hmm. in this disease. You know, they have tried to use, uh, you know, light therapy yeah, and yeah. that kind of thing to to get rid of that vascular malformation to see if it would impact, you know, long term uh, development, especially mm -hmm. if you do it, you know, when the when that uh, individual is very very young, uh, and there just there hasn't been a good result from that, unfortunately, no. Um, so yeah, it's more, and that goes to the fact that it's more than just a you know a cosmetic thing. Mm, There's a yeah, lot more yeah. going on here than just the uh, you know the birthmark that they have. So um, so th th it's a, it's a low flow uh, vascular malformation, and this is a, as opposed to uh, what we call a high flow mm -hmm. vascular malformation. That's a vascular malformation that has to do with both an artery and a vein, something that we call a arteriovenous malformation and um, that has a whole other you know set of implications there is a form of this disease that um, you know involves a vascular malformation mm -hmm. of that type and again the it's it's harder to treat and uh, the prognosis is not quite as good so uh, so this least, guy got lucky yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, so the yeah, silver yeah, lining yeah, yeah. here is that he's got uh, you know just this uh, the port wine stain, you know, capillary type malformation. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to treat him in, in uh, you know, control his symptoms over a long period of time. So 
so we see the Port Wine stain. We see the enlargement of the extremity. Uh, and uh, this is, again, it's not, it's not swelling. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the soft tissue and the bony structures and everything are enlarged. And that's why, uh, the, you know, there's, uh, there's a greater girth to that leg uh, as that patient gets older. And the, the leg is often a little uh, longer in length. Um, so, uh, it, and, uh, it can be variable. Um, we, you know, some, some, some cases not present, <clears throat> other cases it's more severe. Um, sometimes it, most of the time it involves just one extremity. So, uh, the most likely or the most common scenario is it involves one leg. One leg, yeah, uh, which is what this guy was, exactly. This, this is yeah, what this yeah. guy has. And, however, it can involve more than just one leg. It can involve <clears throat> both legs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes it involves an arm. Sometimes it involves a, a, a por- one side of the trunk or, or the other. So it can be pretty extensive. Uh, and, and again, I think the more fortunate people are those, those people that have just, you know, involvement of one extremity. And <clears throat> luckily we can do a fair amount to control their symptoms and findings in that one uh, extremity. So um, the skin changes in addition to the port wine stain then, uh, you know, the skin changes that we see are very similar to uh, skin changes that we see in chronic venous insufficiency uh, at those higher, uh, you know, levels, those higher C levels, Mm -hmm. you know, that we've talked so much about, um, you know, in just in chronic venous insufficiency as that uh, venous hypertension persists. And as we see the uh, the changes that that occur in the skin, and that is you know pigmentation, uh, darkening of the skin, uh, the skin becomes thick and fibrotic and mm-hmm. rough, uh, you know all those things we see in chronic venous insufficiency. We also see in uh, this uh, in this situation, uh, and we have to we have to be concerned about the same thing because these people also are very susceptible to. Um, you know, skin breakdown, mm-hmm. chronic venous ulceration, uh, and uh, w- which uh, it, which we treat in a similar f- sort of fashion. It's just that uh, that venous hypertension is a little more difficult to uh, treat fully and control in people with this uh, syndrome, KTS. And, so, and by the way, if any of the stuff that you've heard about, it sounds a little bit like you, chances are it is a little bit more like you than you think. So what you really want to do, and be, and I want to make sure before we run out of time, that we remind you that what you're going to do is you're going to go hunt online. You're going to have a good time looking at this at veinclinicsofhawaii.com. Veinclinicsofhawaii.com. You'll see some of this stuff. And there's a, there's a way that you can contact uh, the clinic through the website and, and uh, get a consultation at no charge to find out if you indeed have some of these symptoms that need to be looked at and then eventually treated. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we, they have the, getting back to what they, they have clinically, again, they're uh, fairly extensive varicose veins. We've kind of talked about that, but I did want to touch on, um, other organ systems, um, that can go along with this also. Um, and that's important because mm-hmm. of the fact that, uh, you know, bleeding can become an issue. You know, you've talked, yeah, you talked about bleeding, you asked about bleeding before, um, uh, you know, KTS, uh, the vascular malformation of uh, Klippel-Trenaune syndrome can be also internal, so it can it can affect the gastrointestinal tract, which you don't see, I mean, which you can't yeah, yeah, see yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so you can have you know those vascular malformations and hemangiomas in the spleen, and uh, you know it often involves the uh, the lower colon. And rectum, and um, so uh, the the danger there is bleeding because mm-hmm. these vascular malformations are on that the inner lining of the uh, GI tract, and it can create uh, either cr- you know chronic blood loss or very sudden blood loss, uh, you know, which can be uh, obviously a vascular emergency. Uh, it can involve the genitourinary tract, so you can have bleeding, mm-hmm. you know, blood in your urine, mm-hmm. uh, and this this kind of thing can happen. So. Uh, there are other organ systems that also have to be, uh, you know, sometimes uh, evaluated and addressed. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just various uh, diagnostic things that we have to do to completely define that. 
uh, and uh, just, you know, do whatever has to be done with respect to those, uh, you know, secondary kind of things. But, uh, you know, the, the general... The general treatment for this uh, syndrome is similar to venous insufficiency, except that we 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 go very slowly. We we have to kind of do it in a very, you know, judicious yeah. and stepwise fashion because uh, it is one of those situations where if you don't you know if you don't handle it uh, absolutely correctly, it can be, you know, it can make things worse with time. There you go. And gang, listen, we've run out of time and we could go another couple of hours on this and we will do some more on it in the future. But if you want to know more, the easiest way to do this is go to veinclinicsofhawaii.com, veinclinicsofhawaii.com. And you know, we, we want those legs to be healthy. You get those legs to be healthy. I mean, everything, everything is just going to uh, follow right in its footsteps and, and be just uh, perfect for you. So uh, please think about that and think about Vein Clinics of Hawaii, and we'll see you next time. Aloha. Well, that's our program for today, and we certainly hope you enjoyed meeting us. Please come back next week for our next episode. And in the meanwhile, to learn more, please visit our interactive website, veinclinicsofhawaii.com. That's veinclinicsofhawaii.com.